So uh, for the long time, we've been trying to uh, better uh, tailor the treatment according to patients' true risk. And, and as I mentioned, uh, even within those categorizations, uh, there is uh, considerable heterogeneity. And so uh, I was at the ASTRO meeting a few years ago when Dr. Spratt uh, first presented the data that you showed. And I took a screen grab and, and uh, when I returned to the, to the office, I, I looked at those six uh, uh, categories and asked myself, how would I treat each of the patients in those categories differently? And, and that's where uh, we go in the next slide. You see, I, I kind of came up with a decision tree based on those risk categorizations. So patients who have uh, low risk disease uh, and uh, NCCN low risk and a decipher low risk, uh, if you sum those numbers together, you get zero, obviously. They're very low. Um, uh, and uh, what I was thinking is that those patients should best be managed by active surveillance. But if uh, they were unwilling to consider a surveillance, uh, we would offer them uh, radiation therapy in the form of either uh, external beam treatment or brachytherapy, monotherapy. Likewise, the patients who have um, uh, low risk disease and uh, an intermediate risk uh, to cipher score, we would give them uh, monotherapy, uh, either a radiation loan or brachytherapy. But again, many of those are also candidates for active surveillance. But when we get into that challenging group of the intermediate risk uh, uh, cases with either favorable intermediate or unfavorable intermediate, that's when uh, we're all challenged to ask ourselves, when is the uh, appropriate use of hormone therapy? And I thought the uh, scores that uh, uh, Dr. Spratt uh, put forward would be helpful. And so uh, we continue to offer uh, monotherapy for those patients who have that sum score of two, favorable and intermediate risk. But when they have unfavorable and intermediate risk, uh, we consider a short course of engine deprivation therapy, four to six months. And of course, men with high-risk disease, uh, today we still offer them a long-term engine deprivation. And for the very high risk, uh, I, I uh, encourage, of course, all patients to consider clinical trial. But for those patients with the very high risk, uh, we were at the time exploring adjuvant therapies like chemotherapy or some of the new novel anti-angine therapy drugs. So going to the next slide. Our final case is a man who is uh, 60 uh, years old, a PSA just under four, uh, two of 12 cores were positive for Gleason group two, three plus four, and a uh, MRI showed a right peripheral zone lesion uh, by um, the former NCCN guidelines. He'd be considered a favorable intermediate uh, with low volume. Um, and without the genomic uh, information, we would uh, plan to proceed with IMRT alone or brachytherapy alone and not offer this gentleman androgen deprivation therapy. The next slide. But when his decipher came back 0.85 uh, and the predicted risk of, of higher grade disease, that prostatectomy being nearly 50%, 36% risk of METs in five years and 19% risk of prostate cancer death in 10 years, I felt that monotherapy radiation alone was not sufficient. And um, next slide. Uh, we decided that uh, uh, with the favorable intermediate risk disease and the high decipher score, uh, a sum of three, that uh, radiation with a short course of energy deprivation therapy would be in his best interests. And that's what indeed he, he has uh, received. I wanna thank you, Dr. Mahalski, for your time and presentation and thank the attendees for, for joining. Thank you, Ryan. It's been my pleasure and they were great questions. I appreciate the participation. Mm -hmm.